about the deep technical details of algorithms. And now today, this is going to be something completely different. It's going to be a quick tour through a very useful Python tools for the data scientist. So data scientists just love diagrams, and I'm no exception. Data scientists also like to describe who and what they are in terms of diagrams. And I found this one that is quite fitting from my perspective. It shows you that the data scientist needs to combine various skills, various skill sets from quite different areas. Of course, programming skills and statistics skills, but also uh, business savvy and communication skills to communicate the findings. <clears throat> and the perfect data scientist, according to this diagram, is in the intersection of all of these areas. And we are always, as data scientists, we always have to balance our skill set so we don't end up in the corners like the computer science professor or the hacker or the salesperson. And the internet is also full of diagrams describing what a data scientist does. The data science workflow was the title of this. Of course, there's more than one data science workflow. But this is quite typical, what we see in this diagram. This is quite a typical sequence of steps that you go through when, for example, you do a predictive modeling project. First of all, we have, to, of course, to acquire our data, think about how to ingest the data and clean the data. Um, if we are dealing with big data, we have to invest some time into thinking about storage and management. Then, for our predictive modeling, we need to uh, explore the data and extract important features from it. Visual analysis is very important in this phase, and the bringing the data into the right format for our modeling is called data wrangling, and it's usually an extensive part of the project. They say it's 80% 80 80 of the time of the data scientist is spent on preparing the data, wrangling the data. And 20% is usually spent on complaining about the need to prepare the data so much. So during this data wrangling phase, uh, visualization is very important and the ability to interactively query and explore the data. Then we can go on to our modeling step in which we build, for example, a predictive model, um, evaluate the model according to quality criteria, and also think about deploying the model. And in the end, when that's done, of course, we have to tell a story to our stakeholders about the findings and about the workings of the model. And fortunately, the Python world provides a great set of tools that help you and support you in all of these stages of a data science project. And this is what this talk is going to be about. So we often speak of an ecosystem of tools. And here we also see an ecosystem of marine life in Antarctica, different species of animals, and the arrows show which species is consumed by which one. We see the animals are specialized to different uh, ecological niches. Some are more on the periphery, some are very central. And why do I have this picture in the talk? I also drew a dependency graph of important tool, Python libraries for data science, and it really reminded me of this ecosystem diagram. So I think it's a very uh, fitting analogy to speak of an ecosystem. Different Python libraries build upon each other, and a good library kind of occupies an ecological niche. It does a certain task really well, and this is why it's there. So I'm going to go through the different phases of a data science, typical data science project. And this is the data wrangling phase. And I'm going to present three tools that are really extensively used in this data wrangling phase. That's Pandas, NumPy, and Dask. First of all, NumPy. NumPy is really 
the fundamental package for numeric computing in Python, and really, as you've seen in the dependency graph, this central library on which almost all the other libraries are built. So what NumPy provides is essentially an n-dimensional array object and also powerful mechanisms to apply, apply functions efficiently to these arrays. And it also gives you some implementations for math, like linear algebra, generating random numbers, and so on. So the NumPy n-dimensional array is a data structure that could, for example, represent a two-dimensional matrix. Uh, seen from the outside from the Python view. You could also implement the matrix with, a, with Python lists. That would be no problem. However, to gain real uh, efficiency in numerical computing, we want to lay out the numerical data in memory compactly, uh, which is one of the fundamental techniques of high-performance computing. Uh, a list in Python, as you may know, is... Uh, points to an array of addresses, and these addresses point to objects in memory that could be lay out, laid out in an arbitrary way. With the NumPy array, we nicely lay out the data compactly in memory, and this is one fundamental trick to make things fast. And of course, I don't have uh, the time here to go into detail or give a good introduction of NumPy. If I had to summarize uh, NumPy in one slide, which I have to, and answer the question, why should you learn NumPy? Then I would say understanding NumPy helps you to lose the loops from your code. For example, here we, in this example, we generate a million random numbers and take the logarithm of the numbers. And being good Python programmers, we can write this down nicely as list comprehension syntax, um, st very compact, very useful. Still, the list comprehension is an ex ex explicit Python loop. So the Python interpreter performs a loop, and in every iteration, there's some cost. Uh, we have a little perform performance penalty for all the flexibility that Python gives us. However, we c to make this really efficient, we can also implement the same operations with NumPy functions. And as we see in a time measurement, um, we gain uh, more than an order of magnitude speed up, sometimes uh, two orders of magnitude. So the trick here is that NumPy pushes the loops down into compiled code. So understanding NumPy helps us to efficiently compute and lose the Python loops in our code. And this is also why NumPy is really at the basis of almost all of the libraries that follow now. The next one that's built heavily on NumPy is Pandas. And Pandas is really also one of the most important libraries for the data scientist. What Pandas provides is essentially uh, labeled indexed array data structures. For example, a series or a data frame, table of data. Then efficient operations on these um, data structures like join or grouping operations it has a lot of features for working with time series. It gives you, of course, the input and output tools for the usual data formats, and it also gives you some statistics code. This is very abstract, so the best way to introduce Pandas to somebody who's new to Pandas, for me, is a real, short, real quick example. It's real for me in the sense that this is a task that was given to me in a job interview, and it's quick in the sense that I had about 15 minutes to solve this task. So the task was find a correlation between the number of inhabitants and the number of museums in the departements of France. And here's the data, two files. Good, pandas to the rescue. We can do all of this with pandas, and I'll quickly show, it, show in the next slides how this could be done. We import the pandas module and uh, start reading the first data file, the departments file. It's in CSV format and we can read it and with the head function quickly inspect the result of the operation. We see it's a table of 
departments with different uh, demographic data and different statistics on the departments. We only care about the name and the total population, so in this line we filter the data frame to keep only the two important columns. The other data file is in Excel format, also Pandas reads that easily, and uh, we see it's a list basically of museums um, with certain attributes on the museum. For example, the name of the department in which the museum is located. Now, how do, how do we bring the two together? We're interested in the number of museums per department. So in one line of Pandas code, we can group the museum's data frame by the name of department and calculate the size of entries for each department. And we get back the series of name of the department and number of museums. And then to match these two data items, we need to do a bit of string processing, like um, bring the names of the departments into the right format. Also, Pandas gives us very efficient uh, methods of string processing. We need to set the index correctly because we want to bring these two uh, data frames together. And with these join operations, we can do exactly that. And this is the result of the join op operation. So we're almost there. We have the name of the department, the total populations, and the number of museums. Now, we forgot to convert the popula total population to, uh, from string to numeric data, also one line of pandas. And then in the final line, we get our result by calculating the Pearson correlation coefficient. For. So if you know pan pandas in and out, you can easily do this in a couple of minutes. And it really pays off to spend time on practicing your panda skills because tasks like this, data wrangling, it will happen all the time. Now, we practice on pandas and we build our skills and become really good at pandas and suddenly we get a big data file um, where the data doesn't fit into memory anymore. What do we do? Need to, do we need to learn yet another library? Fortunately, there is a project called Dask and Dask does a lot of things. But among others, Dask provides you a data frame object which um, combines many pandas data frames into one object that mimics the pandas API. So we can use that, for example, to do distributed computing on a cluster where, um, with a data set that doesn't fit into the memory of only one machine. And since Dask nicely mirrors the Pandas API, we can transfer our Pandas skills to this big data distributed scenario. Now, the next phase. We've loaded our data and uh, processed it. And now we, want, uh, now we care about visual exploration and presentation, which is uh, very important. And, there are a number of tools in this ecosystem. They're marked in green here. And I'm going to go, go through these quickly. The fundamental one for plotting, certainly Matplotlib, the standard 2D plotting library for Python. It provides you a MATLAB-like interface. And using this interface, simple plots can be created in a relatively few number of lines, but anyone who's worked with matplotlib knows that uh, it gives you very fine-grained control over the aesthetics of the figure. You can do get any look, any visual you would like to. However, it can get very verbose. You have to write a lot of boilerplate code. So it's great that there are a couple of libraries that build on matplotlib. For example, Seaborn. Seaborn aims to give you production-ready statistical graphics on top of Matplotlib. For example, to fit and visualize linear regression models, uh, to visualize matrix data, support for time series, and so on. And it works very nicely together with pandas and NumPy data structures. And they say that they give you improved styling of Matplotlib graphics, 
uh, translated, it means usually Seaborn figures look cool out of the box. You don't need to do much tweaking. A quick example uh, with a data set that's often used as a toy example in statistics, that's the so-called iris data set. And it's data on flowers, different species of flowers. Um, that, and it turns out you can quickly tell them apart by measure, measuring the leaves or the flowers of these different species. So we have the petal width, petal length, and so on as data columns. And we've loaded this into a pandas data frame. And now one line of Seaborn um, gives us a nice visualization where two dimensions are plotted against each other in a grid-like fashion. And it also shows us that um, the species are nicely separable in certain projections of the data space. So great tools for exploration of, in Seaborn. Of course, there's a lot more than just this pair plot method. Now, um, we know how to plot things in 2D now, but what if we want to design interactive graphics? A great library for interactive graphics is Bokeh. Uh, it basically does many of the same things that Matplotlib does. It's very similar in, in the fine-grained control of the aesthetics, but it gives you um, interactive graphics for free targeting modern web browsers as a platform. Um, it's inspired by the famous D3.js library. And Bouquet is very useful if you want to build interactive dashboards or data-driven applications, especially for the web. So in this small example, we um, can see how plotting with Bouquet works in many ways similar to Matplotlib. We plot a line. A uh, line plot of a couple of toy data points. However, as you can see here, we get interactivity for free. So we can zoom into the axes. Uh, we can zoom into certain areas. We can reset the view. So very few lines to create um, visualizations that give you interactive tools to uh, inspect the data. And then yet another library for data visualization, which is rather new. It's called HoloViews. Um, their claim is that with HoloViews, you can focus on what you're trying to explore, not on the process of plotting the data. Uh, they say you can annotate the data with semantic metadata and then, quote, let it plot itself. And you can use Matplotlib or Bouquet as a backend to HoloViews and easily switch between them. Now. This sounds cool, but it really needs an example to make it concrete. In this example, we have a data frame of um, certain demographic data about countries, where we can read that the United States in the year 1966 had the following GDP and so on. And now we would like to explore this data set using hollow views. We use Bouquet as a backend because we want interactivity. And now we can annotate this data frame for the exploration task that we want to do. For example, we want to explore figures like unemployment or trade in relation to the time, the year, and the country. So we say uh, year and country are key dimensions, and this is our collection of value dimensions. We wrap the data frame into a HoloViews table, and then it's basically one line to plot uh, an appealing visualization relating year and country to unemployment. We give a couple of options on the aesthetics of the figure, so we nicely separate what we do from how exactly it should look like. And the result is interesting. It, for example, it gives you, because of this annotation, a hover tool so you can inspect the data set with the mouse. 
And of course, since it's bouquet, everything is fully interactive. So interesting approach. Um, don't focus on the details of plotting, but annotate the data and sort of let it plot itself. When we've explored our data, we can go on to the modeling phase, for example, building a predictive model. And here I would like to present two libraries that are important in this phase, uh, the scikit-learn library and the stats models library. Scikit-learn is the, I would say, the first address for starting with machine learning in Python. It provides you, of course, a collection of machine learning algorithms for classification, for regression, for clustering or dimensionality reduction. But maybe more importantly, it gives you a collection of building blocks in which you, with which you can build your pre-processing and model selection workflows in a structured way. Here's an um, example how this could work. Um, Scikit-learn has a modular approach that revolves around estimators, transformers, and pipelines. An estimator is an algorithm that is trained with a data set, um, then gets a test data set, and produces predictions for the test data set. So first we fit the training data set, and the second step we feed it the real data set and predict certain estimates. Most of the algorithms I mentioned for, for classification regression are estimators. But before an estimator can do its work, we often need to bring the data into the right format. We need to transform it so it works well with the machine learning algorithm. And for this, there's the transformer interface, very similar Data is fitted to the transformer and then it can be applied to, the, to other data sets uh, to transform it in some way. For example, if there are missing values in the data, we can uh, create educated guesses for the missing values. And often we need to do more than one transformation of the data. Um, so scikit-learn gives us this very nice pipeline mechanism in which we can stick together a sequence of transformers, and this sequence is again a transformer, so we can build nested pipelines of transforming the data. Then there's uh, stats models, library that's important in the modeling phase. Uh, stats models is basically a collection for uh, of models and statistical tools for modeling, testing, and exploring the data. And it's sort of Python's, the Python world's answer to R. So it can be used as an R replacement in many respects. It contains things like regression models, tools for time series analysis, well-known statistical tests, and so on. So you might ask, since both of them, both stats models and scikit-learn are used in the modeling phase, uh, which one should I use? Where should I start? Especially because stats models and scikit-learn have many models in common. For example, regression models or logistic regression. They're contained in both. So what's the, what's the difference? Where are the strengths of the two libraries? Scikit-learn has a strong focus on machine learning and it has this very Pythonic and modular approach. Uh, on the other hand, stats models a stronger focus on statistical analysis and modeling, and it gives you more hardcore statistician tools, for example, more diagnostic model parameters, uh, presupposes probably a bit more statistics knowledge, and it's easier to get into for people coming from the R world. So these are the two strengths of the both libraries. Okay, now for something completely different. I wanted to talk briefly about network analysis. Um, before, in all the examples, we dealt with tabular data. We had some items and some attributes on the data. 
now in network analysis, uh, we're not really de not dealing that much with items and their attributes. We're dealing with items and connections between them. And these connections can be represented in graph data. And this is what network analysis is about. We want to model certain phenomena as graphs and explore the, uh, their connections to uh, do modeling and prediction. Um, this used to be my um, thesis topic while working on algorithms, and I had this example slide where um, there was a network study where researchers, biologists, observed dolphins, and it turns out that dolphins have social networks of friendship and family ties, very much like humans. And the researchers observed these dolphins. Two dolphins swimming together was represented as an edge in the graph, and then they represented the complex social structure of the dolphins and analyzed the graph and made certain conclusions about the social life of these animals. Just a quick example for where uh, network analysis can be used. Of course, there's so many more examples, social network analysis on humans, um, graph analysis on the web, and so on. And to get started with network analysis in Python, um, your first visit should probably be to the Network X library. The Network X library gives you uh, a tool, tools for the creation, manipulation, and study of the structure of complex networks. And it provides network analysis algorithms like centrality algorithms, page rank, for example, algorithms for constructing the graphs, and so on. And it's written in pure Python. Any object can be a node, for example. So it's extremely flexible and also easy to use. Here's a quick example what we can do with the Network X library. Here I read um, this dolphin social network from a data file, and it creates a graph. And now we would like to analyze this graph, we want to know the importance of nodes according to the eigenvector centrality measure. That's very simple, uh, very similar to PageRank, the original algorithm that Google used to, uh, class to uh, rank the importance of websites. So one line of Network X gives us this, um, the scores, the centrality scores, and then another line of Network X helps us to visualize the scores the larger the node, the more important it is. So Network X is great for these uh, examples. If you're dealing with a couple of thousands of nodes and connections, you can make it work in Network X. But if you really want to do graph analysis at scale, millions of nodes and connections, uh, you need something different. And you can apply the same trick that NumPy applies to make things efficient. We pu again, we push down the algorithms and data structures into compiled code, and there's a number of libraries that, support, that uh, implements this approach. There's iGraph, there's GraphTool, and there's NetworkKit, which is a library I started during my PhD research. Now, at the end, I would like to talk about what I called meta tools. They're not specific for data science or data analysis, but they're so useful throughout this entire process. And by that I mean, of course, the IPython shell and the Jupyter notebook. You may be familiar with IPython. It's a really powerful interactive Python shell. Um, it also does other things, like it provides tools for parallel co computing, and again, I can't go through all the useful features that IPython provides. I'll just give you one quick example of an extension to IPython that's really useful for me at the moment. Because uh, my predecessor and colleague really liked this programming language with the eccentric syntax that's called R. R is really popular in the data science field. 
But also, Python works nicely together with R via this IPython extension. It used to be called R Magic, now it's called RPy2.IPython. And if we load this IPython extension, we can very quickly uh, com combine code from Python and code from R together in one project. Here, for example, we read a data frame, again, the iris data set, uh, with pandas. And with this line at the top of the cell, we transparently convert it into a R data frame. And then we can use R to work on it. it works in the other direction just as well. We could use R to read the data, annotate the cell with this line, and in the next cell we can continue with a pandas data frame. So, very easy mixing of two languages for data analysis in one project with the help of IPython. And of course, last but not least, uh, Jupyter Notebooks. One of my favorite tools for working with Python, uh, work, uh, working on data science projects. If you don't know this, um, and if you have any interest in Python programming, check this out. Jupyter gives you interactive notebooks in which you can combine code, documentation, and graphics together. And uh, interestingly, that's, uh, that's a vision that was described in a book from the, the famous computer scientist Donald Knuth in 1992 already. He thought, well, how about we write programs that are really fun and easy to read like a good book, combining the do documentation and the code and graphics together so we can just read it. He called it literate programming. I always thought, nice idea, but um, where, why, why don't we have it? With Jupyter, really, literate programming is going mainstream. Uh, Jupyter is not just for Python. Um, it's language agnostic with support for other languages like R, Julia, Scala, and m more and more languages. And it has this, uh, in this nice NB convert tool, which allows you to export notebooks to PDF format, to HTML, and for example, build slides for your talk with it. All these slides have been built with, with Jupyter. Again, I can't give you a tour of all the interesting and uh, useful features of Jupyter. I'm just plugging two features that are really interesting and uh, relevant for me at this point. NB-DIME is a Python module that does the following. It gives you content-aware diffing. So now, what does this mean? If you look at the data file of a Jupyter notebook, it's very verbose, it's many lines, it's not really human readable, and normal diffing, as Git does out of the box, usually doesn't work really well. So it's always been a pain to work with uh, Git and Jupyter notebooks, because merging, diffing, and so on could break the notebook. This tool really comes to the rescue, and for the, um, using the tool you can finally manage your Jupyter notebooks in Git and also very nicely compare two versions of a notebook with a web interface. And if you work in an organization together with others and you would like to collaborate on a Jupyter notebook based work, then I can really recommend Jupyter Hub. It's a multi-user server for Jupyter notebooks. For example, at my institute, we successfully use it to, to share the computing power of uh, a workstation. Very nicely integrates with, with the um, operating system. So everything is separated with the rights management. So if your organization is working with Jupyter Notebooks, you should really consider Jupyter Hub as an addition. All right, that would be the end of my quick tour uh, through the Python ecosystem for data science tools. Um, thank you for your attention. If you would like to continue the conversation later, you can get in touch with me through these channels. And now I think we have 
lots of time for questions still left. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your talk. Uh, are there any questions? You touched upon some, some things playing well together. Could you give us a summary of things that maybe don't play well together and we should not use together? Well, um, the point was that all these things play well together and Python is, good, is increasingly good at making these things play together, of course. At some point, you could still improve the, the interlinkage of the libraries, like, for example, Pandas and scikit-learn. But there's no... Ma I have no example for something that really fails in this respect. All this can be part of your uh, workflow and your tool chain, and you can make it work together. Okay. Uh, any others? Questions? Uh, just to make a brief announcement, we do have a five-minute delay, so the next session will start at 12.25. Uh, you still have lots of time to ask questions, so don't be shy. Hi. <coughs> Sorry for my voice. <laughs> I have a cold. Um, there's <coughs> this stats models. Stats models? Yes. Does, uh, can it really compete with R? I mean... Personally, I'm not an R user, and uh, I try to get around using R uh, whenever I can, being a Python fan. So I would be the wrong person to answer this. Like, you need to use, uh, ask somebody who has equal experiences in both. So I, I gravitate towards stats models because it's Python, and I find the syntax of R really weird. You're not alone. <laughs> Anyone else? Going once, going twice, gone. Okay, thank you. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you, thank you.